Welcome to All About Buffy, Episode 2, Part 2, Take 2. I, uh, I continued right after the last video. And uh, I immediately got a little heated while talking about a certain subject. And I thought, no, no, no. Let's break for a second. Um, also, my battery was about to die. So I stopped the video, checked on the cat, changed the battery, threw on my extra pajama shirt, and uh, now we're back for another try, which I guess technically is my third, third time talking about episodes of season two. But you know what they say, third time's a charm, so I'm gonna stay calm. Okay, so season two kind of starts the This is a great start. <laughs> I already can't find the word. Um, but season two basically starts the um, theme, the habit, the issue I don't know, uh, of me not liking the first two episodes of each season. maybe in season six and seven, especially six, it's a bit different, but season two, three, four, five, I do not like the first two episodes, so both when she was bad and some assembly required, I dislike. Um, the first episode I really I really like school hard, but so the first other episode I really like is Lie to Me, um, where an old friend of Buffy's comes to Sunnydale and, you know, he appears to be this nice guy normal, um, likable, but it turns out that he is part of this strange, <laughs> I say strange, but vampire worshipping, um, immortal life idolizing cult, uh, and I say strange, but, uh, I shouldn't say strange because I was never like that, but um, definitely was adjacent to that. There used to be this website called Vampire Freaks that I was on all the time. I met a lot of people through there. to be these 
these vampire nights at this club in Antwerp once a month that I was allowed to go to once or twice um, and you know interestingly enough I went goth before I started watching Buffy so that was good timing I mean, I was, I was goth for about two years already when I found Buffy, so I digress. So they are mostly a bunch of delusional kids that romanticize vampirism and, um, they're aware that it's real and they they yeah, they want to be part of it so uh, the friend I forget his name I want to say Scott, but Scott I think is the guy in season three season three boy. So the boy, unbeknownst to Buffy, has made a deal with Spike to deliver Buffy to him and basically all of the other friends in his little cult in exchange for eternal life because uh, other than them, he's not romanticizing the ordeal. He is dying. He has terminal cancer and he's just got a couple months left. So he is going in eyes open. Um, but he doesn't want to die. Now, you know, It's not really easy making handshake deals with the soulless, so it all doesn't work out for him, um, but I think it's a really interesting episode that explores lies that we tell ourselves to keep going and the lies that we are willing to believe to keep going. So I really enjoyed that episode. Already talked about What's My Line Part 1 and Part, part 2, which I really love. The episodes with Kendra. I really like how she's introduced. I really like her character um, and how that all plays out. And then there's an episode called Ted. I hate that episode. I hate it. I hate it. Um, so much. So I can't explain it. It's just, it's a true filler episode. It serves no purpose. It centers around a man, an evil man, but it's, I just really hate it. I hate it. And it made me have a hard time seeing John Ritter and, and other programs after that, which, which, is, which is a shame, because he was a good actor. But. So, and then, um, we've got 
bad eggs. I could talk for a while about bad eggs, but it's nothing important. Anyway, then we've got surprise and innocence. So, this is the moment that just now I got a little got a little overexcited, so I'm going to try to keep myself calm and collected this time. So, we've got surprise and innocence. Um, at the end of surprise, Buffy and Angel sleep together, and in innocence he loses his soul, and we deal with the aftermath of that. And now, um, So, I really like what they tried to do there, but it's, it's, it takes some explaining. So, the part that bothers me is that they chose Buffy losing her virginity to do it, to progress the storyline in this way, and to use this very powerful metaphor in this way. So, I would have loved it much more if this had not been Buffy's first time. Um, so, if either she Yeah, so basically if she had already had sex before, it doesn't matter with who. Um, because doing it this way, I feel, promotes purity culture. Uh, and so even though I like what they did, and I'm going to come back to that, I do want to state for the record that I am very much against purity culture. And not just purity culture, but basically anything to do with virginity. Um, so I think that the concept of virginity is pointless and very harmful. And I think that there are zero positives connected to virginity being a concept. Um, hear me out. Okay, so this is not to say that I think sex is meaningless or should be seen as meaningless. Um, or should be taught as meaningless. But this is to say that using the concept virginity to teach anything involving sex is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. Okay? We teach our kids tons of values. Tons. Okay? Without ever needing such a concept. We teach them about friendship, about love, loyalty. Um, we teach them value of money, um, so many things without having any comparable concepts like virginity. Okay? There's a ton of things that we do for the first time. And they don't have terms. 
first time you have a sleepover at a friend, the first time you go to a club, the first time you drive or ride a bike, the first time you I don't know, eat chocolate, I don't know, I don't care, anything, it doesn't have a term, okay? It's even when you have a child, or you get married, or you get divorced, or any of these, major life steps. There isn't a term to indicate that you have not done that, or a term to indicate that you have lost something once you do do it. You know what I'm saying? So, with all these other things, we just say first time, and that's all that we need, you know? That's all that you, you need to express the importance of something, okay? You can tell, okay, you tell, okay, the first time that you go to a concert without your parents is important because or the first time you get an allowance is important because da, 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 da. the first time you have sex is important because da, 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 da. okay we don't need the term virginity we don't need it and it only does harm and if you think that you need the term virginity to teach your kids self-worth or self-respect or anything like that, then you're probably not the right person for the job of teaching them self-worth and self-respect. Because if you think the two are tied, That was the calm version. <laughs> so I fucking hate purity culture, and I really, um, I think it's unfortunate that they used her first time to tell this story, because it very much promotes purity culture. But I still think it's important that they did tell the story of a man turning on you once you have had sex um, because it happens um, doesn't happen all the time thankfully it has never happened to me uh, I've mentioned before that I'm the type of person that learns from other people's mistakes instead of my own so never happened to me, but I have plenty of tales that I could tell, and I think anyone that has women in their life has a lot of tales like that that they could tell. So I do appreciate that they told the story. You know, they love to work with metaphors, and uh, a man literally losing his soul after you have sex with them is quite a powerful metaphor. Um, they come back to that situation again in season four, which I think is even more 
powerful when it happens because it's not our first time and it is conscious at that time so you know this time Angel didn't know what was gonna happen it's not like he spent a season and a half um, being the nice guy to get her into bed and then ditch her that you know no one knew what was gonna happen but for Buffy, for a split second there, it felt that way. Um, more than a split second. It felt that way. When she didn't know what was going on. And so in season four, it's a little more clean cut. It's not a metaphor. <laughs> in season four, it's not a metaphor. It's just reality. Um, but so I appreciate the, the way that they that tale. Yeah. Okay, good job. That was so calm. Um, okay. So, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered obviously annoys me to death. Don't think I have to explain at this point why, but fucking sad, man. Um, but yeah. Passion, wonderful episode, very painful, very dark, beautifully done. And then we have Killed by Death now. Pretty much filler episode, I guess, you know, demon of the week, um, but it's kind of special to me because it is one of the only two episodes in the whole series that ever slightly freaked me out, um, now. Horror in general doesn't really have an effect on me. Horror in Buffy, I don't think has an effect on anyone. Again, because they're just using horror to tell a tale, and they started out very low budget, so I don't think the, the demons scare anyone. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's like anything to brag about that the show doesn't scare me. I'm pretty sure that it doesn't scare anyone. Um, but So Killed by Death is one of the only two episodes that at the time when I first saw it, it did kind of like freak me out and not just gross me out because there are some other episodes that do gross me out but this kind of made me feel like no and so what happens is Buffy gets ill and Slayers aren't really supposed to get ill so that means trouble is afoot, and she ends up in the hospital where she discovers that kids are uh, dying and, you know, she thinks something's going on. There's these flashbacks to her and her cousin Celia, it's all thing, and it turns out to be a demon that only you know, that feeds on sick children, and only sick children can see it. And so, the demon is called Der Kinderstolt, and I don't know if it's because he's German, because that's creepy, just period. Like, nothing against the country or the people. But 
do your good at creepy shit. Just, just stream them. So, but what I really think it is, is when he feeds, there are these, like, tubular things that grow out of his eyes and, like, open up. And I really think that the holes, the black holes, trigger my uh, tryptophobia or what's it, what's called tryptophobia, tryptophobia, something like that I don't know what it's called because I can't look it up because when you look it up you get images so someone in the comments tell me what is it called, is it tryptophobia? Trypophobia? What is it? Because I can't look it up. I could look it up in a dictionary. <laughs> Shit. I'm such a millennial. Am I a millennial? Okay, I don't know. Okay, no. I could look it up in a dictionary. But is it in there though? Is it new? I've got three big dictionaries over there, but they're decades old, so I don't even know if it'll be in there. It was Der Kindstadt, so yeah, that's what I think it is. It freaks me out. After that, is one of my favorite episodes. I love it. Um, it's called I Only Have Eyes For You. Um, and in it, um, the school is haunted. So there's the Sadie Hawkins dance going on at school. And around it, some strange things start happening. So there's people writing some strange things on the board without wanting to. Um, and there's some incidents where you have someone that suddenly holding a gun, about to shoot someone and then they're stopped and the gun disappears and they have no idea what they were doing or saying or where the gun came from so a bunch of strange incidents and we learned that it's a haunting, quite a classic haunting um, where the ghost of boy, Let's see, what's his name, I don't know, a student in the 50s is reliving, recreating this experience. Um, so he was having me to see what language I use because if I just, I can't just say he was having an affair with a teacher because, well, he's a student, he's young, and she's in a position of power, so, you know, you can't technically call that a relationship or an affair. I guess technically he was being taken advantage of by a teacher, he was being abused by a teacher but you know, it's portrayed as a romantic situation 
which I guess uniquely can be the case, but generally, you know, you don't want to go around saying that teachers can have relationships with students and that not being a problem. So, there's a student, a male student, and his teacher is taking advantage of him and so he thinks he's in love with her she thinks she's in love with him but she wants to put an end to it so this is all in the past, in the 50s she wants to put, a, put an end to it, break it off she's like, this is not good for you this is not okay, we can't do this anymore this has to stop he did not like that. Um, he did not agree, and so he confronts her, and he um, gives her the speech. They have an argument. They have. They exchange some choice phrases, and he's like, "Tell me you don't love me. Tell me you don't love me enough." leave you alone. So she says, I don't love you. And starts to leave and he screams, don't you walk away from me, bitch. And I think there's probably a couple more lines and he shoots her. He shoots her. She falls dying and he goes to the roof of the school or someplace and he kills himself, he jumps off and kills himself and so it's his ghost that's haunting the place but and he's recreating the experience, reliving the experience by having other people relive those last scenes between them and basically because he feels guilty uh, he's trapped in that experience and so the Scooby gang go in to stop it I guess or if they want to go in but um, only Buffy makes it in there's like a biblical swarm of bees or something going on that stops the rest from getting in. Um, Buffy makes it in. Who is also in? Angel. So they get sucked into the recreation, you know, they become puppets, ghost puppets, where Buffy is possessed. Do you get possessed by ghosts? By the boy, and Angel is the teacher. Fitting, since we have that whole 250 year old vampire situation and 16, 17 year old girl situation so, you know some parallels um, and they go through their last moments together and so they're speaking the words that they spoke to each other and suddenly they make all the sense but in Buffy and Angel's situation and, you know, it's beautiful it's just beautiful you don't see it coming you think it's a Monster of the Week episode 
something they have to solve. It sneaks up on you and suddenly you're watching this play out and you're like, holy shit. And it just works so well. It works so well. And so they go through those lines. Tell me you don't love me. Tell me you don't love me. And I'll leave you alone. I don't love you. Angel walks away. Buffy shoots. Buffy is, don't you walk away from me, bitch. And shoots him. He falls. She starts walking. She goes to the area where this kid killed himself and before she gets a chance to, Angel stops her because Angel is a vampire. A gunshot doesn't kill him, so he's alive. And so for the first time in 50 years, their scene doesn't end there. And Angel stops her. The teacher stops the kid. And they continue to have a conversation. And again, the conversation makes sense both in the storylines of the teacher and the kid and Angel and Buffy. And she forgives him. They say that they love each other. They kiss. And the haunting is lifted. So the ghost gets his rest and is able to let go. Um, because he got his... Um, forgiveness, I guess. And so it's lifted, the spell breaks, Buffy and Angel's kiss breaks. Angel is immediately disgusted and evil. Buffy is left standing, confused and broken. I think we then see Angel back at the mansion, scrubbing himself, like to get the ooky feelings off of him, I think. But I'm honestly not sure because I don't know. It's the other scenes that are so stuck in my head. And I think it's just really beautifully done. I think it's a little bit of a genius episode that really attests to the genius of the creator. It's, it's good. It's really good. So yeah, that's I Only Have Eyes For You. Now, the last episode before the two-part season finale is a kind of a classic filler episode, uh, kind of a little bit of a break before we go into a very heavy finisher called Go Fish. And as filler episodes go, it's one of my favorites. Um, there is so much goodness in there. Uh, one of which being Wentworth Miller. He plays uh, one of the swim team, one of the swim team's athletes. Anyway, Wentworth Miller. He plays it so well. So well, like from the uppity sort of disdain, disgust to the 
submissive, scared, pathetic, beautiful. So, the episode is about the swim team, and basically they turn into sea monsters. It's all very shape of water. And uh, so, at first, you know, they just see the monsters and they think the monsters are going after the swim team. They think they're eating them. Um, but along the way, they figure out that it is the swim team. The swim team is turning into monsters. And so it turns out that the coach is giving them some sort of vapor um, that turns them into really great swimmers for a little while and then monsters. Um, and it's just, it's just well done. I think I probably love it because um, of the subject matter that it addresses, which is rampant sexism and misogyny in high school. Uh, so that's kind of the focus here. So, you know, I just, I like that it's addressed. I like that it is dealt with in true Buffy fashion. And there's just some really good moments. Like I said, there's some really great scenes with Wentworth Miller. There's, a, there's some pretty amusing scenes with Xander when he uh, joins the swim team. There's this scene which is very Shape of Water where Cordelia is talking to one of the monsters that's in the swimming pool and she thinks it's Sander and she's giving this whole speech about how she'll find a way she'll find a way to continue to love him and And, you know, it's just kind of satisfying. The coach, the sexist pig that he is, gets dealt with in a very satisfying way. And, and the monsters swim off into the depths of the ocean. Which is also kind of nice, because... didn't choose. They didn't choose it. They weren't bad people, though. So, I would have totally been okay if they all died. Right? It's nice. So yeah, go fish. Good filler. Good filler. And then becoming one and part one and becoming part two which I went into in my explanation of the plot. Really, really like those episodes. I mean, it's a shame that Kendra died, but And, um, yeah, it's well done. That smile was because I was thinking about the scene where Drusilla is just completely making out with Giles. <laughs> and Spike and Angel are like, uh, uh, that's 
enough. We've, we've got the information, you can stop now. short. Probably not though. It's probably an half an hour. Time flies when you're talking about Buffy. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of don't know when I got started on this part to do. Take technically three. So, but it's probably not short. flies when I'm talking about Buffy. Okay, well, as always, let me know um, anything. I feel like I haven't talked about Oz enough. This time will still come, I guess, but please do not mistake that for me not liking Oz. Oz is great. Okay. I should stop talking now. Good night. See you in episode three about season three. Good night.